Man, it sure feels good to finally have that video done about which Pokemon should be able to fly. Time to finally rest. What? No, no, no. What, 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 what are these comments? Waylord is less dense than air? Guys? Is this true? What? Why did it? Huh? No! Oh. Oh, oh no. Oh, it's looking likely. Science. 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 No! TV? TV? TV movies? Oh my god. Oh. It's true! Oh no. First of all, I'm not talking about the move in battle in which Pokémon do some kind of alchemy to produce an incredible amount of water, even in a desert, but just about whether or not a Pokémon should be able to swim with you on its back. And we're not talking about dive here, we're talking about surf. So the Pokémon needs to be able to swim at the surface so that the rider doesn't get submerged. Additionally, there's a wrinkle about surf that I think is pretty important here. A big component of surfing in Pokémon is definitely moving from place to place, but arguably more important is the ability to float in one place so that you can fish or battle trainers. Floating in one place with a person on your back is no small feat. One thing that's good about this is that when analyzing fly, it was crucial for the Pokémon to be able to move pretty quickly. For surf, the maximum surf speed in the games is rarely faster than just the swimming trainers who seem to swim for hours on end, so it can't be that fast. Therefore, for deciding which Pokémon should be able to learn surf, we're going to focus primarily on whether or not the Pokémon should be able to float comfortably in place with a person on their back. The information on which Pokémon can actually learn surf in the games already is weirdly all over the place online. Pokemon Database listed as 139, Bulbapedia says it's at least 220, and Cerebi's list is different too. I mean, what is going on here? How do we not have a definitive list for this? To solve this problem, I went to my community Discord server and asked my serfs, I mean subscribers on Twitch, if anybody would like to jump into a spreadsheet with me and go one by one and determine which Pokemon can actually learn surf. This meant checking every single Pokemon's learn set individually to see if any time since Kanto, the Pokemon has been able to learn surf by any means. That means HM, TM, TR, or level up. After all, learning surf has taken a lot of different forms over the years. I'm happy to report that the official ADEF community list on which Pokemon can learn surf, including alternate forms and mega evolutions, is 271. That is a lot. The big problem with HMO3 when compared to Fly is the sheer abundance of creatures, not just in the world of Pokemon, but on Earth also, that can tread water or swim. Since Earth and real-life animals are our data points for these types of videos, we have a lot of variables to consider. When looking at the entire list of Pokémon and trying to narrow down what list of Pokémon I can consider for this, I have to broaden my scope beyond just water types or just Pokémon with fins. I have to check every single Pokémon this time. To give you an example of what I'm talking about, let's take a look at a Pokémon that, depending on who you talk to, definitely should or should not be able to learn Surf. Rhydon. I mean, it's, it's in the name. You, you ride on. No? Ever since Gen 1, Rhydon has been able to learn surf. Now the core problem with people... What are you doing? I'm, uh, I'm, I'm typing my YouTube comment. But you haven't finished watching the video yet. Uh, yes, I know that. But uh, in episode 204 of the anime, a Rhydon uses surf, and you've already failed to mention that. I only just started talking about him, and besides, that came up in my research, but I can't talk about every single little thing I find, or the video will be like a hundred years long. <laughs> Obviously, the big problem people have with Rhydon swimming is that he's a rock type. Given that I don't think swimming is even remotely the same thing as being hit by a water type attack, though, I personally can accept that a rock type like Rhydon should be able to swim so long as it is physically able to keep itself afloat. Rhydon has a bipedal structure and could reasonably tread water. Alongside any natural buoyancy Rhydon might have, treading water aids in keeping him afloat via the same physical principle we talked about that let birds fly, lift. When you're in the pool and moving your arms and legs around, you're generating a lift force in the water. So if my logic on how Rhydon can swim is that he's treading water, that explains the logic for any humanoid-shaped Pokémon, but what about fish? What mechanism do they use to float? Or what about people when they're not treading water? 
or boats or ducks. Is a duck a boat? Much the same to how birds and airplanes have to overcome their weight force in the air in order to fly, fish and sailboats and cruise ships and jet skis have to do the same to overcome their weight force in order to float in the water. There are many ways to do this, but the primary force we're going to talk about is the buoyant force. Renowned circle lover Archimedes found out the fundamentals of this so-called buoyant force over 2,000 years ago in ancient Greece. Archimedes' principle states that when any object is placed in a fluid, the buoyant force of the fluid acting back up on the object is equal to the weight of the fluid that is displaced. That's kind of a mouthful, I know. But basically, the amount of force that water pushes back on you with when you get into a pool is equal to the weight force of however much volume of water you just displaced when you got in. So what matters here isn't just your weight, it's your volume too. Since both mass and volume are important here, we use the quantity density, which is mass per unit volume, or mass divided by volume. We represent density with the lowercase Greek letter rho. It kind of looks like a P, but if you like take the little like wing part off the top, you know, it's like, it's like a P, but like only part of it. It's a part P, part P, P part, part P. I'm gonna shut up. If I have a tank of water and I submerge a large cube that weighs 10 kilograms and a tiny cube that also weighs 10 kilograms, both cubes have the same weight force since they have the same mass. But the cube with the larger volume has a larger buoyant force acting on it since it displaces more water. If the buoyant force is equal to the weight force of the cube, then the cube is naturally buoyant, meaning it will float suspended in the water wherever it is placed. If the cube has a volume large enough and density low enough, then the buoyant force will overcome the cube's weight force and it will rise through the water and float on the surface. It is positively buoyant. As for the tiny cube, it doesn't displace enough water and the buoyant force is less than its weight force, so it sinks. Hence, it is negatively buoyant. If I make a boat out of 500 kilos of steel in just a cube shape, it's probably not gonna float. But by spreading that mass across the vast surface area of the bottom of a boat and making lots of compartments on the boat which are now filled with air, a substance far less dense than water, I have dramatically reduced the overall density of the vessel, allowing it to float. After all, air is three orders of magnitude less dense than water, so having a lot of our volume occupied by air dramatically reduces our overall density for the system. This is also how blimps and balloons work to float in the air. Blimps and balloons are filled with gases that are less dense than the air, which is the fluid they're displacing. Since they're less dense, they float. So if the primary principle we're talking about for floating or sinking or staying in place is changing one's density, how do fish do that? Well, many types of fish contain an organ called a swim bladder. The swim bladder contains a mixture of different gases, and fish can readily change the concentration of these gases in order to increase or decrease their overall density. The other cool thing is that this isn't the only mechanism that sea creatures use to float. Cartilaginous fish use an oil-filled liver, squids use a pretty similar mechanism to the swim bladder, whales use the natural buoyancy of their blubber, as well as coming up to the surface to regulate the air in their lungs, and jellyfish are made of nightmares. So now we know, generally speaking, how things float. From this point, I could take the same approach as my flying video and collect a bunch of fish data and then construct some kind of graph or equation, but I don't think this is gonna be that simple. Since all I need to figure out if something should be able to float is its density, I can probably do that with just data found in the Pokedex. And besides, most of our contenders here aren't fish, so it wouldn't really be fair to use just fish data. Here's the little derivation trick I'm gonna use. The buoyant force is equal to the density of the liquid times the acceleration due to gravity times the volume of the object. We know that density equals mass mass over volume, and we can rearrange that to say volume equals mass over density. Now we can replace the volume in our buoyant force equation so that we have the density of water times the acceleration of gravity times the mass of the object over the density of the object. We know that mass of the object times gravity is the same as the weight force, so rearranging a bit tells us that the buoyant force is equal to the weight force times the ratio between the fluid's density and the object's density. Basically, if the water is more dense than the Pokemon, the ratio will be greater than one, meaning that the buoyant force will be bigger than the weight force and the Pokemon should float at the surface. If the Pokemon is more dense than the water, the ratio will be less than one and the Pokemon should sink. Okay, sounds simple enough. So all I have to do is compare the densities of every single Pokemon to the density of water. But density requires three dimensions. All the Pokedex gives me is a Pokemon's height. How do I estimate the width or the length? The chief question that kickstarted this video was whether or not Whale Lord should be able to float in the air. 
I'm not the first person to attempt answering this question. Many have before. My two personal favorite attempts at this are estimations from William Farmer at the University of Leicester and by Sam Flower on Tom Rock's Maths. Links to tons of the attempts I found online will be in the description, including those two I just mentioned. What connects most of these attempts is approximating Waylord's volume using a cylindrical approximation. I'm gonna use the same trick here, but broaden it to use it on every Pokemon. Since the volume of a cylinder is equal to pi times the radius squared times the height, and I already have the height of every single Pokemon, all I have to do is estimate their radius. Since something like Jigglypuff has a radius of about half its height, but Rayquaza's radius is more like a 20th of its height or less, I'll have to do this individually for every single Pokemon and then calculate each one's cylindrical volume. For Pokemon with wings, arms, or tails, just imagine that they have them tucked in close to their torso. Once I have a Pokemon's volume estimated, I'll just divide its mass by that volume estimation to get the Pokemon's density in kilograms per meter cubed. Putting that in our density ratio with the density of water will tell me whether or not the Pokemon should be able to float. For this calculation, I'll be using the density of fresh water, since any Pokemon that can learn surf has to be able to surf in both the ocean and in rivers and ponds. The reason we're using fresh water instead of salt water is that fresh water is less dense than salt water and thus more difficult to float in. Before we bother adding on the weight of our protagonist and figuring out the whole surf component, which Pokemon can just swim on their own? Well, I'm happy to tell you that unlike the flying video, I actually have good news. The number of Pokemon that should be able to swim is massive. The results are good. The numbers are big. The number of Pokemon that can swim is big. I can't rhyme. Including all Mega Evolutions and alternate forms and so on, there are 1,217 Pokemon. Out of those 1,217, 1,179 of them can float. Let's go! That's right. If you threw a random Pokemon into the deep end of a swimming pool, there's a 97% chance that that Pokemon would naturally float, look back at you very angrily, and end your life with Hyper Beam. Uh-oh! As it turns out, Pokemon are remarkably non-dense. I think this kind of makes sense when you think about it, because like, the people that are putting in this information into the Pokedex, at least in the earlier games, probably didn't think about it very much, and rightfully so. The weight and height of Pokemon rarely matters unless you're talking about a move like Low Kick or Grass Knot, and even then, I feel like it only matters if the Pokemon is really heavy or really light. Anything within those ranges doesn't matter too much. I mean, in order to care about the height and weight data of Pokemon in the Pokedex, you'd have to be like some kind of nut who's like wasting their life talking about physics about some nonsensical garbage in a children's video game. Now, with 1,179 total swimmers, I don't think it really makes much sense to go through the entire list of who can float because we'll be here forever. So let's talk about the ones that can't. Let's start with the water types. Horsey, fascinatingly, is way too dense to float. Coming in at 1,768 kilograms per meter cubed, Horsey is 76% too dense to be able to float in water and would sink straight to the bottom of any river. Joining Horsey next up are all three forms of Tatsugiri. They all have the same dimensions as each other, so the density is the same for each, but they're also too dense to swim. Maybe that's why you really only find them on land in Scarlet and Violet? I don't know. The same goes for Clampearl and both forms of Shellos. Luckily, that's all of the water types on this list of Pokemon that can't float, but it's not all the Pokemon that can learn Surf in the games. Both forms of Zigzagoon and both forms of Linoon can learn Surf in the games, but can't swim according to my calculations. One of the Pokemon that can't swim is Cosmoem. Cosmoem has a height of 0.1 meters and a weight of 999.9 kilograms. Even if we assume Cosmoem is a perfect sphere with a radius of 0.05 meters, that still nets a volume of 0 0.00052 meters cubed, and a density of 1.9 times 10 to the sixth kilograms per meter cubed. For reference, that's about 12 times denser than the core of the sun. If you want to pause the video, here's the entire list of 38 Pokemon I found that aren't able to swim, but let's look back at the question that started this video. Can Waylord float not just in the water, but in the air? Well, the same calculation I used to figure out if Pokemon should be able to float in the water works for other fluids too. I just substitute the other fluid's density for the density of water. Wildly, I found out that not just Waylord can float in the air, but also eight others. That's right, I found nine Pokemon who literally can't come down from the stratosphere. Ghastly and Haunter both make this list, which actually makes a ton of sense and is genuinely the first thing on this entire spreadsheet, to which I out loud said, oh, nice. 
Galarian Weezing is here too because Weezing and his gas-filled chambers refuse to leave me alone in these science videos. As predicted, Waylord is here also with a density of about 50% that of air, meaning he is a literal blimp. He's not the only Hoenn attendee though, as Primal Kyogre joins him as well. The next one feels weird since it's actually a big group of Pokemon, but the school form of wishy-washy is less dense than air. I don't know, do with that information whatever you want. Next up are Cursula and Eternatus, and finally our list of nine is rounded out by Don Dozo. That's right, another big whale-shaped Pokemon that floats in the air. Game Freak, what is going on over there? Just one more thing I want to mention, and I truly did not know where to put this in the video, so here it is. As a side effect of Mew and Natu both having heights that are one-tenth of their own weights, and the fact of the radii that I estimated for them, when I compared their densities to the density of water, the ratio came out to be a perfect estimation of pi to as many digits as you want. So that's fun. Math is weird. Okay, so most Pokemon can float on their own. That's awesome. Lifeguards will be out of business in the world of Pokemon. But which Pokemon can carry a person on their backs and thus learn HMO3? When I was estimating the weight of the protagonist for my last video, I came up with the approximation of 81.7 pounds, or about 37 kilos. Thank you to all of the YouTube comments, especially this one, pointing out that I really could have just taken this data from the Gen 4 Pokedex, which lists the protagonist's weight. But not only that, this comment also points out that my approximation was weirdly close, since the Gen 4 Pokedex lists the protagonist as 38 kilograms, meaning that my approximation based on child weight data I found was only 3% off weird. When figuring out if Pokemon could fly, I just added the weight of the protagonist to the birds, since that was a pretty rough and good approximation for whether or not their weight force could be overcome by their lift force. I won't get into the details of the calculations because they're actually pretty complicated, but when you're stacking two things on top of each other in a system like this, you can't just add the densities. So I need to somehow incorporate the person's density into the Pokemon's density in order to figure out if they should be able to float as a system. Instead of estimating the new volume and thus the new density based on a system with the protagonist riding the Pokémon, I'm going to estimate a system in which the protagonist's mass is evenly distributed throughout the Pokémon itself. Basically, I'm estimating what would happen if the Pokémon ate you. Sorry. The reason for this is that it doesn't change the volume, but it does add the person's mass, so the density will always increase by the maximum amount possible. This way, not only is the calculation way easier, but we should be getting a more definitive list. Okay, so we started with 1,179 swimmers, but when we tack on the protagonist's mass, we're still left with 882 Pokémon that can learn Surf. Even if I went through and picked out specific Pokémon that I think shouldn't be able to swim because they might die, like Charmander or how Spoink dies if it ever stops bouncing, I would probably only wind up getting rid of like 30 or 40 Pokemon. So instead, let's just believe in a more magical world where no one can die. Yay! Something else amazing is that even when adding a person, six of our nine previous Pokemon who could float in the air still can. One final really weird thing I want to leave you with is that, and I haven't really mentioned this yet, but alongside the cylindrical volume approximations, I also estimated every single Pokémon's volume as a sphere, just to compare the two numbers. The reason I haven't brought it up yet is that the final tally of which Pokémon could surf wound up shockingly similar, and quite frankly, I found the cylindrical approximations more accurate. But, if Steelix were to curl itself up into a ball, which doesn't feel that unreasonable, uh, it can float in the air. As Mario would say, that's a no good. <laughs> Help me. All right, with Surf and Fly out of the way, we've covered the major mobility-based HMs. I don't really feel the need to make videos about dive or waterfall or rock climb because those kind of feel like derivatives of the first two anyway, so. Wait, but what about Flash? Oh God. Thank you so much for watching. Please subscribe if you don't want to miss the Flash video or any other science-based Pokemon videos I'm cooking up right now. See you next time.